I think I first visited Norfolk Historical in the 1980s. It's hardly been a year since that I haven't visited. And there is not another local historical organization in the state of Connecticut that does the quantity and quality of changing exhibitions they do here. Every, the, the number one, not number two, number one. And it, they're so good that I just would never miss one. And we've seen many, many over the years and tackled so many interesting topics. And it's, again, proof that all history is local and that if you really work at it, uh, you can just, it's a whole universe that opens up for you. So we, we were here visiting last summer it's the, the Main Street exhibit, which triggered a reminder aware of something worth studying, the idea of Main Street, but never had the time or excuse to do it. The exhibit was great. The many we've seen over the years have all been great. This became a perfect excuse to drill down into the story of Main Street. My passion for preservation, architecture, and local history is rooted in what I witnessed here as a kid growing up in Rochester, New York during the 10 years before the great suburban diaspora turned a magnificent Main Street and downtown into a shadow. And this is a story that is common everywhere. Uh, among my earliest impressions at, at the age of seven and eight was going downtown with mom. And, you know, this was before there were malls anywhere. And if you think of the commercial the concentrated commercial power of a central place, a downtown or a main street as the hub of a wheel. And then you put malls out on each spoke and drain the center of its purpose in a sense, wind up with in each slice of the pie, if you will, they all have the same national chains. Me, the, the experience of visiting downtown and main street was like the Emerald City, uh, something to look up to. I learned about pride of place from that experience and that sense of reverence one might get from church going into one of these city centers. The Rochester Museum and Science Center is one of these brilliant institutions. It's not that old. It was founded in 1912, but they have had this diorama. And as a kid, I would stare at this thing and just always loved seeing it. I think it was about 1932 and it showed downtown and Main Street as it would have looked at the height of the canal era, say 1840s or 50s. Scratched an itch I didn't know I had, but I love looking at this diorama. The idea of downtown as a place with landmarks, even if they don't know what they are, even young children can observe a building like you kind of stand back and you're, you're in awe that they're, they're, they're so Im impressive in a way. And what are we looking at here? It's just a Greek revival. In Western New York, the 1830s is like the beginning of time because they weren't settled until much about that time. On the upper right was the Sibley's department store, which is a big deal. On the lower right is the Rundle Memorial Library. And on the lower left is George Eastman's little house, which is one of the biggest colonial revival mansions. I think it's 30 square feet and he was of course the founder of eastman kodak uh then my next stop in, in high school was in bellows falls a town of about 2800 today which has had almost 5,000 at one point and uh it gave new meaning to my understanding of main street when planners and preservationists talk about places with good bones they're mostly referring to places like this that have good to phenomenal building stock, mostly left over from the golden age of urbanism and industry. Even small centers had local industries that made goods for export. Great buildings and building stock is never sufficient, but usually quite necessary to be a small, great place. Bells Falls it was uh, one of the pioneering centers of the papermaking industry, among others. It was also a place where two different railroad lines converged. Even towns like this that wouldn't appear to have been industrial actually did have local industries. Usually they're connected to water power. So where there's a waterfall or water power, there's going to be a mill. And in Bellows Falls, they made farm machinery and paper found, that found national markets. They also made had a woolen mill. They manufactured furniture, marble, sashes, blinds, washing machines, carriages, rifles, and organs. 
I love Bellows Falls. Every place needs strong local historians, devout students of place that help the living learn a little bit more about those who came before and built the place. Well, my next stop was in Middlebury, Vermont, where I went to college, which is about three times the size of Bellows Falls. Uh, and to my astonishment, my freshman year in college, looking over the catalog for fall, fell off my chair when I discovered a seminar on Middlebury architecture. In other words, there was a professor using the town uh, as a textbook, essentially, for learning about architectural history. And since I already had the love of all things local and indigenous, uh, I signed up for that. And it really, it, in a sense, almost changed my life. Middlebury's most deliberate and proactive improvers, we learned about them and the Patels were among them. The Philip Patel moves to Middlebury and, and, and does in Middlebury, Vermont, many of the things that the, the family were doing, doing here. Uh, uh, among the tactics of these founders were founding a college, uh, and a sh which was a short walk from this downtown. These are magnificent places that never had even 10,000 residents. Are they large towns or small cities? Not sure we got the right word for it. They are urban and cosmopolitan. They are regional hubs that, at least in New England, usually support a regional circle of about 30 miles. They are the standard bearers of those regions. A great many of them were and are intentionally beautiful. My first job out of college was working for the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. I put 15 towns on the Vermont register. I spent a year surveying, cataloging houses. What a I mean, minimum wage, but it was, I joke, it was my probably my favorite job ever. I got paid almost nothing to spend all day looking at buildings. And there's no better way uh, to, to learn about this stuff. This place really it moved me. This is Fairhaven, Vermont, which had a population of 3,000 at its peak in 1910. And it's interestingly been more or less steady ever since. It didn't have a big decline. I, you know, identifying, photographing, and describing historic buildings, Fairhaven was about the size of Bellows Falls. But wow, the modest commercial district on one side of an impressive town green, and you can see the little drawing in the upper right there, and in the center is a Google Earth picture of the town green. It's really quite beautiful. What blew my mind was getting inside the 1882 Green Brothers block on the lower right there, and walking in, going on the top floor, walking into the opera house on the top floor, where it was still 1920. Uh, I, I, this was 1978. 77 that I actually had that experience untouched as if the last vaudeville act that passed through town had just left and nothing had changed since and realizing that these blocks were mostly residential on the upper floors with small businesses a restaurant or two a lawyer's office on the ground floor a full service semi urban center uh, all, all their own is what what Fairhaven had and just I mean this was so exciting to me Fairhaven also across from the commercial district in the on the green are these houses built entirely of marble marble was one of the local industries and you, you don't have to be an architectural historian to look at something like this and 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 think to yourself Wow, somebody around here must have been rich because <laughs> these were expensive, really ostentatious, amazing houses. Fairhaven pioneered the marbleized slate industry. There, they had both marble and slate in that area. And marbleized slate is processed slate where they decorate it. And getting into some of the houses here and seeing, like the upper right there, these marbleized slate mantelpieces, locally made, locally designed. On the lower right, there is a house uh, from probably about 1860 or 70. The exterior, it's not clapboards, it's not brick, it's all covered in slate. So again, these are the kinds of little details that give you a, a sense of what the place might have been. I don't know. Uh, the housing stock throughout the, this town of about 3,000 is one of the largest concentrations of fairly high-end artistic Victorian houses I've seen anywhere. Uh, maybe a local manufacturer 
making art products was a factor. It's not in the mountains and it's not near the ski areas, so it hasn't grown or shrunk much in a hundred years. But this is a town with great bones just five miles from one of the state universities, a town where $150,000 would buy you a decent historic house. Uh, I love Fairhaven, Vermont. After this job, I was heading off to, you mentioned, went to a museum to graduate school. But by this time, I had the bug. And when we drive through, and we always, particularly in those years, take the long way home. If there's a way to get from point A to point B that involves back roads, that that's we're going. And and so I one began photographing interesting downtowns, interesting main streets. Uh, this is Fort Plain, New York. Uh, I was always a shutterbug. I increasingly noticed distinguishing features of places I traveled through. I made it my business, especially when traveling through less familiar areas to take the long way, the old road through places worth a look. There are so many. This is Fort Plain, New York on the Mohawk River, halfway between Utica and Albany. These aren't throwaway places, though many are poorer than they were a century ago. Anyone can, with eyes can tell they were thriving in the 19th century. So, well, a little history on Main Street. I suppose it starts here. This is the, the, the reproduction Plymouth Village in Plymouth Mass, Plymouth Plantation, uh, created by archaeologists and craftsmen in the 1950s and 60s to replicate what they figured Plymouth might have looked like in 1628. And no stores, no commercial much of anything, but people, human habitation seemed to cluster around together in along these main main streets. And in old old Deerfield, they call their main street the street, because that's about all it was at the time. The New England village with a church on the green, epitomized by the recreation known as Old Sturbridge Village, shown in the lower left there. Before the railroads in the industrial age, by the 1790s, we begin to see dozens, eventually hundreds, of village centers and main streets, often with a church on the green, where the local burghers and elites built houses that, among other things, telegraphed the moral, aesthetic, and architectural aspirations of their community. It was, in a sense, advertising, part of the beauty contest in which towns competed to attract settlers, businesses, and acclaim. Yale President Timothy Dwight's famous circa 1810 travels in New England and New York is filled with descriptions and character studies of the hundreds of such places. Above is Wentworth, New Hampshire, a town where the population peaked in 1850 at 1,200, and is today a mere 845 is the population of Wentworth, New Hampshire. But look at the village green, look at the houses around it, and look at this amazing church. The lower right is Pittsfield, Mass., which in 1790, with a population of just under 2,000, hired Charles Bullfinch to design that church. It no longer stands. But by 1825, when this picture was made, the population has risen to about 3,000. There was a second church on the left, and on the right in that picture is the Berkshire Medical School, founded in 1823, a village green and a mother with a mother and child expressions of civility and refinement. So this is, you know, the kind of idea of the New England village uh, and the main streets that were emerging before the era of railroads. One of my heroes is New Haven's John Warner Barber. Uh, uh, he's somebody worthy of a whole book and lecture. I would even say a movie. Uh, one of the nation's two or three most influential book publisher engraver at Aquarians in the 1830 through 60 period. His book, Connecticut Historical Collections, published in 1836, uh, 560 pages long with 180 illustrations. He then went on to do similar books on Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and more. His History and Antiquities of New Haven from 1831 and then the historical collections of Massachusetts in 1839, among other things. These books extolled the virtues of our small religious New England commonwealth. And the thing that just 
kind of makes my head explode is the idea of this guy going around with a sketch pad on horseback to every town in Connecticut and drawing these little pictures that they were then worked up into engraved prints for the books. And it's, it's a, an extraordinary visual record of uh, the world as it, as it looked in, in the 1830s. Well, the next movement that begins to evolve right after the railroads arrived, they claim that the village improvement society, and you can Google that phrase, village improvement societies, it's said that the first one was in Stockbridge, Mass. in 1853. Over the next half century, various national magazines promoted the movement, and dozens were founded in places like Wareham, Stonington, Greenfield Hill, and East Hampton, New York. I mean, these are just some graphics that I have. It was the first women's environmental movement. Uh, some have called it civic housekeeping, an early example uh, of uh, women's civic activism, as the ladies of Thompson, Connecticut put it in 1874, the object of this association shall be to promote civic improvement, neatness, order, sanitation, and to beautify and render our village attractive. Well, that's a mission statement. We're interested in anything and everything that may tend to add beauty, helpfulness, and good order to the village. Uh, regarded village life in America as one of the happiest fruits of modern civilization. So I searched for Village Improvement Society, and these are just some of the many articles. When I did the search for the term Village Improvement Society in Genealogy Bank between 1870 and 1905, I found 2,845 articles. So this, this is evidence of a movement. Well, there's a long history of this, and that's a topic for another day. But women, a lot of times, start things. And then when it looks like it's going to succeed, the guys show up. But they change things. And uh, the next generation uh, were, were cut from the same cloth. And this would be uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, George Dudley Seymour. And on the lower right there are... Fred Olmsted Jr. and Cass Gilbert, who was a renowned architect. And, and they, this generation, beginning mostly in the 1880s, invented the profession of city planning. Was reminded I'd heard of Sinclair Lewis and his book Main Street, which was the number one bestseller of 1921. And yes, uh, Barry is correct. This was a fictionalized version of Gopher. Well, he called it Gopher Prairie, but it was based on the town in Minnesota where he grew up. And if you go there today, you'll see that they've got a sign that declares it the original Main Street. His fictionalized version of his hometown in Minnesota, among the characters in this fictionalized book, were Dyer's Drugstore, Howland and Gould's Grocery, Dahl and Olson's Meat Market, a tobacco shop called The Smokehouse, The Bonton Store, Axel Eggs General Store, Sam Clark's Hardware Store, Chester Dashaway's House Furnishings Emporium, Billy's Lunch, The Ford Garage and The Buick Garage, one-story brick buildings opposite each other, newspapers, department stores, both institutions flourished in the great age of the American middle class who underwrote civic life with their window displays, parades, and other attention-seeking activities that enlivened uh, city life. And then who can forget It's a Wonderful Life? As, as wonderful as Jimmy Stewart is, the star of that show is Main Street. I mean, it's the feeling of a place that feels so authentic, and, and it's, you know, it's kind of the battle between the civic advocates and the, the guy with all the money and everybody knows the story. This was called Bedford Falls, New York. Seneca Falls, New York is always very proud to boast that they were the inspiration to Frank Capra for the creation of this. Uh, and then, of course, there's Stockbridge and Norman Rockwell, one of his most famous paintings from 1956 is that Main Street. And 
the photograph below, Christine and I were in Stockbridge a while ago and uh, uh, know the painting, but it turns out it's difficult to, to photograph. He probably had photographs and then lined them up just as I've done. And then who but Walt Disney taking a cue from this, creating how many hundred millions of people have seen this at the Magic Kingdom? Main Street, USA, Disneyland, Disney World, 1955, and then at Disney World in 1972. And what they all do is invoke the characteristics I'm going to describe in greater detail. Well, then in um, the spark of the 40s and 50, 1940s and 50s becomes a flame and a national movement in the 60s and 70s uh, called historic preservation. This is Annapolis. And it was a uh, cover story in Antiques Magazine, I think, in the 1970s with before and after pictures. And, you know, the, the kind of beautification, the, the civic revitalization, cities everywhere, particularly ones that have lost some of their economic stature, are always talking about revitalization. And it's by no means easy. And we'll get to that. But places like Annapolis became the poster child for a movement. And you can see why. And the picture on the lower right shows Annapolis on a June weekend. And uh, that's pretty cool. And then the National Trust for Historic Preservation, most successful thing they ever did was create this Main Street Center, uh, uh, Main Street program. Uh, and there are now hundreds of chapters, including Connecticut Main Street Center. And uh, this is you know, all part of the, 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 the link between historic preservation and urban revitalization. Never an easy, easy thing. Architectural Digest more recently published one of those interminable best of lists. Look familiar? Clockwise, Beacon, New York from the left, Beacon, New York, Northampton, Mass, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, never been there, I'd like to go. And then Pella, Iowa in the lower left, Everyone is looking for the secret sauce that moves the needle on civic vitality. It's a movement called placemaking. But, and uh, so experiencing places, this is one of my great passions, is just looking at places and seeing the landmarks and being able to discern a little bit of their history just through your eyes. And I, I'm, because I've spent it's on my 43rd year now in, in the Hartford area, and I really, it's, I, I love it, and it's been my life's work. I wasn't from Connecticut, but I sure am now, and uh, I've been thinking about Hartford for 40 year, 43 years, immersing myself in the built environment, documents, and historical maps. Those who do local history the way we do and the way you do here in Nor Norfolk know the abundance and authenticity of what we have to work with. Hartford has lost a lot, so we fill in some blanks to gain greater understanding and appreciation. The map on the left from 1850, less than 20 years after the great stone bridge across the Mill River brought North and South Hart Hartford's main streets together with churches, hotels, the State House, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, elegant residences, banks, stores, a vibrant mixed-use neighborhood. Hartford became an office park and a lot of stuff was destroyed, but there's still a lot there. And the photograph on the upper right there shows Hartford's Main Street in the 1870s. These are other views of Hartford. And, and I need to thank my friends at Connecticut Landmarks. Ray Cable, who was a dear friend, he was talking about how he'd spent all of his free time since he was seven amassing postcard collections he had a book on every town in connecticut he wound up leaving us this incredible collection and it's just as a visual aid it's not to be beat I, the other thing we love are the old old maps this is also hartford again it shows from 1869 and you can really these maps will tell you every building what was who lived in it what or what the business was along main street and uh, you really, it's its like archaeology, but without the dirt. And uh, the, this is another map of <laughs> Hartford. So I, I love these old maps. And, uh, 
someday I had, there's a trolley museum in East Windsor, Connecticut, and we've had a conversation about creating a orientation video on public transportation because, which is a great topic anyway, but the, the, the trolley age is coincides perfectly with the postcard age. So even be- towns that did not have railroads had trolleys sometimes. It, the postcard era, which basically is from 1900 to about 1920, overlaps with the beginning of automobiles. And sometimes you'll see pictures with trolleys, horses, and automobiles. This is Norwich, Connecticut, which of all of the once great cities in Connecticut, Norwich probably was the least hammered by urban renewal. So most of what makes Norwich beautiful and special to me and to others is still standing, even if it's not always in the, in the best uh, condition. And this is, again, what da- the idea of Main Street, the idea of downtown, one of the great preservation projects of the past 30 years was the adaptive reuse conversion of the old War Regan Hotel really looked like a fragment of itself. I won't go into the details of all the restoration work that they did, but it's it's really uh, quite impressive. Meriden, 27,000 people in 1910, 60,000 today, slight growth all century. I, I love the awnings on the storefronts, streetcars, parades, streets not paved, reek of horse manure, and yet they were intensely conscious of appearances, and it was very much a team effort, even amongst competitors. Danbury in 1910 had 23,000 people, 88,000 today, big growth since 1950. Uh, It was known as the hat city, where they don't make hats and Danbury anymore, but they made something like 70% of the men's hats sold anywhere in the world and at one point had like 20 hat factories. There's some great buildings there. Uh, City library, banks, distinctive commercial and residential buildings has a sense of place and where anywhere that there are embers of that, a a new flame is always a possibility. And, uh, you know, Bridgeport doesn't always get a lot of respect, had 102,000 in 1910, population peaked in 1950, but Bridgeport was an industrial powerhouse. There's still plenty of evidence of what made Bridgeport special. I, you know, I just love uh, you know, these, these pictures. If, 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 if you were doing a class in local history and the students were assigned to write a paper, to do research and write a paper about one postcard. It would not be that difficult with a little guidance to reveal what all these things were and and what they did and where it was. And there's just so much rich content to observe. Uh, One of the things in Bridgeport uh, is the arcade, which was basically finished in the 18, 18, it's still there, 1889, originally known as the Bishop Arcade, designed as a connector between Main Street and the city's post office, but it's an indoor commercial facility. Bristol, Connecticut, 9,500 in 1910, hovered around 60,000 in 1960 and is stable. ESPN came in there, and that's a big employer, but Again, the postcard age tells us so much about these extraordinary main streets. And then Ansonia, which had 15,000 in 1910, peaked at almost 20,000 residents in 1930. Less now, but everyone in this building will certainly recognize it's not exactly this building, but it's the same architect, George Keller. And I love the Ansonia Library. Below it is the Ansonia Opera House, that I learned, that, which has been boarded up, abandoned for 25 years. But I heard recently that there may be a move afoot to do something with it. Uh, Middletown had 12,000 in 1910, 57,000 in 2020. And actually, Middletown has one of the more vibrant main streets in Connecticut uh, today. And, and so these postcards really give you sense. And You know, Corrington made a lot of progress, I would say, in the past 20 years. Uh, There's a lot of great stuff in Torrington. Uh, I was sorry to lose the last 
Urban Hotel, which was the Yankee peddler, which was still, you could go into downtown on Main Street, enter the hotel and rent a room for the night. And that folded about, and lots of places had, had these urban hotels and very few of them survived. Then New Haven, when I worked at the New Haven Museum, we had a huge 100,000 photographs, 133,000 in 1910. Population New Haven peaked in 1950, 134,000 today. So it's been pretty stable. I'll probably never get around to doing it, but I used to occasionally get professors at Yale would have me come and speak to their class if there was a seminar or something they were doing that where a little New Haven was relevant. And I always thought it would be wonderful to do, to pick all these photographs and do a kind of civic archaeology, because there's just, there's hardly a street in New Haven that wasn't extensively photographed in the early 20th century. And first video, I have a YouTube channel, William Hosley, if you go on YouTube and search that, you'll find it. The first video I ever made took the, a lot of these New Haven photographs and put them to music. They just scroll through. It's called New Haven Memory. But I think it's effectiveness. Mostly it's the existence of these incredible photographs that, that give us the most vibrant sense of what downtown looked like, what Main Street looked like at the height of the urban age. Uh, one of the most photographed events in Connecticut history and one of the arguably the first widely photographed event in Connecticut history was the, the blizzard of 1888. I love the picture below there with the trolley tracks right off in New Haven Green. And, and it's just the people picture, the Irish policemen, the, the, the retail storefronts on the lower left, and these adorable gr girls, probably about 1900, turned out to go downtown with their hats and their dress and they probably were teenagers and that's what downtown was for me at age seven or eight before they kind of blew it up was this extraordinary sense of the emerald city and they did blow it up between yale's endless expansion which i'm more for than against but a lot of things got destroyed and new haven had the most aggressive program of urban renewal in the country. They got more money per capita than any other city and just bulldozed. I think urban renewal did more damage to American cities than World War II did to Europe. And we did it as a matter of government policy. Life goes on. Seneca Falls, Connecticut. I like to share the Connecticut stuff because I know it best. Um, James Kunstler, who wrote a book that may be in the library here called The Geography of Nowhere. 1993 famous book and he has i actually have a little clip of it on my youtube channel places worth caring about he gave a ted talk about why it's important to be a place worth caring about and it's it's so he's an amusing speaker and it's worth looking at well this is what seneca falls really looks like today and it uh had 7,400 people in 1910, peaked at 9,900 in 1970. Today, it's about 8,900. The Main Street, with its reputation as the inspiration for Bedford Falls and It's a Wonderful Life, for a long time, settings like this were viewed as old-fashioned. Today, they can be community gold. Uh, Brattleboro, Vermont is one of those places. 7,500 in 1910, peaked in 1970 has been a little bit flat ever since. What I always say, if you want to see how well a 19th century Main Street or commercial district is doing, look up at the upstairs rooms, even if the ground floor is occupied. The sign of well-being is when it's obvious that the upstairs rooms are in use. It's not Manhattan, but Manhattan is no longer Manhattan. Places worth caring about with character, distinctiveness, independence, and originality. It's the foundation for sense of place. Buildings like these that are care fully occupied means the owner is making out okay. Creativity matters. Buy-in from a variety of stakeholders matter. But so does location. Second and third floor apartments, lights on at night, suggest that down the downtown has crossed a decisive threshold. And this is Brattleboro. And 
Brattleboro, I can't remember. I, I probably go through Brattleboro 15 times a year. Um, I can't remember ever seeing a vacant, a store vacancy. Now, businesses come and go, but they're doing okay, as is Northampton. I remember going to Northampton in the 70s when it was kind of gray and a little old-fashioned looking, and the buildings are all the same, but the vibrancy of what you see when you go, I mean, there are almost too many restaurants, lots of interesting, distinctive stores, almost no chain stores at all. And 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 you can see in the middle there, curtains on the upstairs window, usually a good hint, uh, again, that, that things are going, going on. Great Barrington, Mass, 6,000 in 1910, peaked in 1990. So they're doing quite well at 7,700, fairly steady for 100 years. I don't know this as well. But I'd say perhaps half the residents in Great Barrington are probably New Yorkers or weekenders. It was already happening and probably more have relocated full time during the pandemic. So I'm not sure it has a single chain store on Main Street. The downtown filled with creative, independent businesses, places like this have multiple stakeholders. It's not like Disney where Disney owns everything and designs everything. It, 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 the, the architecture itself speaks to collaboration. Creative independence, bakeries, places where there are multiple stakeholders. Every building represents an individual private investor with a proprietary interest in success. These places have what I would call collective effervescence. And Great Barrington is fun. But if you go into the candy store, better bring your credit card because it's the only place I, where you, you could spend 25 bucks on candy and eat it in three minutes. It's, I'm sure, high quality. Then this past year, we wound up in Jim Thorpe, PA. It's the county seat of Carbon County. Sounds like coal to me. Rebound as an economically stable community. Tourism is based on its vintage architecture and recreation, such as hiking and whitewater rafting, population of about 5,000. It was awarded a top 10 spot on somebody's list of America's coolest small town. Voted the fourth most beautiful small town in America. Well, who, who are these voters? We don't know. Where's Brendan Gill when you need him? Uh, one of the gems of the Poconos, two hours from New York, Philadelphia, and Wil Wilmington. Uh, Jim Thorpe is beautiful and interesting and worth a detour. Uh, so is Beach in New York, 11,000 in 1920, peaked in 2010 at 15,000. Great downtown, hour and a half from New York with Wi-Fi and comfort for a Metro North and the nationally renowned Dia Beacon Art Museum. Pandemic notwithstanding, it appears to be on the up and up. Note the upper rooms in use. You can see the shades and the windows and the care of them. This is Beacon, New York. And on the left is a work of art at Dia Beacon. It's contemporary stuff. And then there are those that have fallen, but have similar 19th century settings with good bones. This is Phelps, New York, uh, has 7,000 people today. Thanks to this project, I'm more observant and interested in these places, prosperous or poor, and we'll document more in the years ahead. Well, you can tell from this picture, some of the storefronts are empty. And the upstairs on that wonderful building, I don't know what it was originally, are boarded up, so that's never a good sign. Anastota, New York, and Waverly, New York. These are uh, uh, other towns. Again, the architecture at a distance looks good, but that picture of Anastota, none of those first floor, well, one of them might have something going on, but they, anyway, it, it, it's tough. And, um, you know, AMP has opened at the American Bureau Project. Uh, the historical side is phenomenal, and with a new direction, they may actually be open from time to time. Uh, Winstead, but the, the we went into Glenn Mills this morning, and it really was humming. It was great speech. And then just a celebration of great architecture. Not all of these Main Street commercial districts have outstanding buildings many of them have at least a couple buildings that you just stand back and you go wow that is really something uh left to right so these are just some architectural jewels from main streets that i've visited louisville kentucky on the left Troy, new york in the center and shelburne falls i love the 
Gothic, commercial block. Not the whole Massachusetts on the right. It's only like one room on each floor, probably tiny. But what a beautiful little building. Great architecture represents the triumph of aspiration over inertia. Any building like this that gets built reflects somebody's total faith, conviction that they are investing in a place that matters and that will continue to grow. Uh, that is also Troy, New York on the left and Rutland, Vermont on the right. Face, love Troy. If you haven't been to Troy lately, run, don't walk. It's with that Vermont green marble that is rare, but you see the whole ground floor is, is clad in that. Um, Binghamton, New York, the Perry Block on the left, which it's cast iron, which is rare. And you don't you see it. And they're here and there, but this is maybe the greatest one I've ever seen. And then on the right is the Perry Block from 1876, designed by architect Isaac Perry from New York. And he was the first New York State architect to supervise the construction of the Capitol building. And then this is Elmira New York. It's like an artist signing their painting. H.C. Smith was an architect, and he signed the building uh, and observed all the windows and glass have been modernized, which is, they may not have done it 100% period, but that's usually a good sign. And then this, this is hard to, these again are architectural jewels. The Goodwin block was, in 1881, was, designed by architect Francis Kimball, who was a supervising architect for the new campus of Trinity College in the 1870s. And on the right is the Cheney Block in Hartford, designed by Henry Hobson Richardson. Uh, this building was the most cosmopolitan thing, designed and built 15 minutes after the model for it in London uh, was designed and built. So they were really stepping high and, and aspiring to uh, great things. And then this will be, again, familiar, just details, beautiful details. And on the upper left is Gardner, Massachusetts, which was the chair capital of North America at one time. Haywood and Wakefield Company made for furniture makers at the time. Haywood was the patriarch who paid for what was originally the town library on the right is in Bethlehem, PA. I don't know what it was originally. And on the lower left, is I'm sure familiar to you. And this, this building is so obviously a national treasure. Incredible. Then there are what I call transformative art towns and art projects. And uh, probably most of you know, or been to Hudson, New York, uh, which, again, the first time I visited there in the 1970s, it looked really down and out. And uh, Hudson uh, had 11,000 people in 1910, peaked in 1930, and has almost 6,000 residents today. Attracted by its quality architecture, a group of antique dealers opened shops on the city's main street in the mid-1980s. The city has nearly seven antique and art shops and art galleries now. Represented by the Hudson Antique Dealers Association, the business revival stimulated tourism and attracted residents, some taking second homes in the city's city. It has become known for its active art scene, restaurants, art galleries, nightlife, in addition to the antique shops. So Hudson, New York is, is an art place. This is the Heidelberg project. You can Google that. But Tyree Dighton was an African-American artist who turned the, like this whole neighborhood of abandoned buildings and an art project, and they, they get several hundred thousand visitors a year. It's pretty pretty cool. And then Winwood Mural, which is another impoverished, once impoverished section of Miami that is being right revitalized by the Winwood Mural Festival, where the greatest mural artists in the world. I don't know what kind of money induces them, but I'm sure there is some thing to come to Miami and just paint, 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 and we had an hour and 20 minutes to poke around before the museums opened in Miami, and we could easily spend three hours. If, if there was a Hall of Fame, a genius work Hall of Fame for uh, civic improvement projects that were transformative, 
this is not only one of the best ever, but probably cost almost nothing to do. They turned, this is Shelburne Falls Pass, and they turned the old trolley tracks after the trolley died. This is in the 1920s. The idea of the bridge as well as they probably do 150, 200,000 visitors a year. And they also have, you know, water. I mean, Children Falls is great fun and very interesting. The one occasion, probably ever, that I'll be in Seward, Nebraska. And my first cousin was in Mineral Point, Wisconsin. I've never been there, but he sent me the picture. So you get the idea that this, this is the gold standard of Main Street downtown is these 19th century uh, townscapes, collections of buildings that until the 1970s were sort of bad mouth. They were not popular, but now they are again. And that's New London, Connecticut. But all those people, that can't be an every, a, a normal Saturday in New London. There must have been something going on. But it is a photograph. And uh, that's maybe more success than most places want. That just shows the vibrancy of, of uh, downtown. Smaller towns like Norfolk sometimes have a few of what I call cosmopolitan urban landmarks designed to stand out in a crowd. And, but I, I regard that as one of the great preservation tribes of the past 50 years. And Dan Hanks had the genius for how to program it to make it sustainable, but Warren Cavanaugh is the one that did all the beautiful restoration work. I wrote a review when they first opened Park to Park, and I said I would pay money to hear somebody scratch the chalkboard in that space. <laughs> Stafford Springs uh, has what I call organic cool, proactive, a critical mass of people who live in a place in passion for civic renewal and enhancement. Stafford Springs is one of my favorite places in downtown the void of national chain stores is a rich variety of small businesses in the community bond together around the idea of moving forward, making their town a place worth caring about. And it's always that X factor of civic care. And this is just some other pictures of, uh, you know, Stafford Springs is great. And if you haven't been in a while, it's worth a, a detour. So, this is Hartford, and when you put, and I love Hartford in my life, when you put Infinity Hall, and politicians and insurance people in charge of urban revitalization, you get something so homogenous and bland that you hope something good is happening inside because nothing good is happening outside. I'm not in favor of it, and I think Hartford has a lot to learn from places like Norfolk. Um, finally, I'm almost done. Jane Jacobs. The familiarity is an elusive word that means something important. That policies are better the closer the decision making is to the people and places affected. Sadly, this is a notion is countercultural now as it was in the 50s and 60s when Jane Jacobs beat back the forces of urban renewal and won. Solving problems and making policy from the bottom up rather than waiting for the experts on how to mandate best practices. This is the central challenge of place, preservation, and community. Uh, and this is why it matters. You may not have this problem here, but uh, you know these things are convenient. There's no question. They're convenient, to be sure. But some of this stuff has to be kept at bay. Nobody looking back at their childhood or growing up or living in a place it's going to be glad because we have a Best Buy. I mean, those things are convenient, but they aren't the things that, that instill a sense of pairing. And, of course, um, Amazon is both a curse and a blessing, the convenience we get, but at what cost? Ironically, it could actually strengthen the local, smaller-scale, personalized businesses and certainly makes the residential experience in the places that have a strong sense of place more enticing. In other words, you can kind of live anywhere, go against the preservation of strong sense of place. I don't know if it's the French thing you first observed it in Quebec, but I love this association of beautiful villages. And uh, maybe a European thing, but really to think about how they present themselves. 
I'd love to see an association of beautiful Main Streets or Main Street, Connecticut, or whatever we, we call it, because, um, you know, they're not all. All places are not equal. And the places that are beautiful inspire us, and beauty matters. Uh, 159 pounds, one of the things we love about Connecticut, is no two towns are, are the same. Uh, in, in a sense, they all compete in a way for everything. They are our civic incubators. Some have more assets than others. Some make more of their assets than others. James Allison, who was famous, the head editor of the Atlantic Monthly, he and his wife spent a year driving 100,000 mile journey to the heart of America, right, writing this book about towns. What they observed that makes places uh, work. Well, one of them surely is programming. And this again, we were just at the White and Yellow. I hope to live long enough to see Winstead, uh, the kind of renewal that, that, that has always been sort of on the horizon. And I think they could learn something. Oh, we, we can in Norfolk win, in short, I like that. They are great. But the, the, the takeaway is that teamwork and collaboration make all the difference. And program, Wayne Mills and the American Mural project seem to be coordinating their schedules. Uh, my little dream is that we could get the phenomenal historical society it's, um, and get that open on the same days, even if it's just four events a year, three events a year, where you roll out the red carpet and, and tell the world, hey, come have a look. The White House was open to the, it blows the doors off the market, but it's that way. And I've been to 500 house meetings, it's just phenomenal. And, and, and it's great that on the win weekends and different times that they open up. Uh, but the historical side, the fact that you do these magnificent changing exhibitions is, is just, just where it's at. Main, so conclusion, Main Street is an idea deeply infused into American civic culture. It was the heart of that sense of place that is the hallmark of outstanding Communities. The urban age had its downside in congested tenants, segregated slums, insufficient open spaces, and polluted air and water. The upside was a vibrant civic spirit, greater economic and cultural independence, and the countless social interactions that are the lifeblood of a constitutional federal republic or a dollar. The presence of a rich and distinctive architectural legacy may be necessary, but is never sufficient. Making a place vibrant and compelling involves vision, planning, teamwork, a favorable location, and luck. Edmund Burke famously held that man learns to love mankind by first loving the little platoon he belongs to. The ability of villages to act together for the common good works wonders. Common action fostered civic happy, which is the magic variable that is fundamental to economic development. Spirit. How many of the thousands of local and state officials charged with community and economic development get this is anyone's goal. We talk about revitalizing downtown and cities. It's never easy. I hope these few insights in the past help. That's it. Thank you so much.